Live from San Francisco, celebrating 10 years of high-tech coverage, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2019. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE's coverage here in San Francisco, California for VMworld 2019. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Dave, 10 years covering VMworld since 2010. Uh, it's been quite a ride, a lot of changes. Sure has. We're going to do a power panel, our format we normally do with remote uh, guests in our Palo Alto and Boston studios in person because we're here. Why not do it? Of course, Keith Townsend, CTO advisor, friend of theCUBE, CUBE host uh, sometimes, and, and Sarbeet Joel, cloud architect, cloud expert, uh, friends on Twitter. We're always jamming on Twitter, so we want to take it to the video. Guys, thanks for joining us on the Power Panel. Good to see you, gents. Good seeing you. Yeah, I, 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 hope, I hope we don't come to blow subject. I mean, we had some <laughs> passionate conversations over the past couple yes, of months. Yes, on Twitter, yes, yeah. yes. The activity has been an all-time high. I mean, snark aside, there's real things to talk about. Yes. I mean, we're talking about VMware, a software company, staying with their roots. We know what happened in 2016. The Amazon relationship cleared the air, so to speak, uh, pun intended. Uh, vCloud Air kind of goes this way. Stock prices goes up and to the right. Yeah, fluctuations happening, but still, financially doing well. Yeah. Um, customers have clarity. They're an operator, they run, they, they target operators, not developers. We're living in a DevOps world. We talk about this all the time, dev and ops. Yeah. This is the cloud world that they want. Michael Dell was on theCUBE. Dell Technologies owns VMware. They put Pivotal on VMware. Moves are being made. Keith, what do you, how do you make sense of it? What's your take? You've been on the inside. Well, you know, <laughs> VMware has a tough time. You know, Pat came in 2013, we remember it. He said, we are going to double down on virtualization. He is literally paying the cost for that hockey stick movement. VMware has had this reputation of being an operator-based company, infrastructure-based. You go into accounts, you're stuck in this IT infrastructure sales movement. VMware has done awesome over the past few years. I had to eat a little crow and say that the move to eject Pivotal was the right thing for the stock. But for the reputation, VMware is stuck. So Pat, what, tallied up $5 billion in sales uh, and purchases last week to get out of this motion of being stuck in the IT infrastructure realm? Will it pay off? You know, it's, I think it's going to be a good conversation because uh, they're going to need those pivotal guys to, to push this PKS vision, of the, their, this PKS and Kubernetes vision that they have. Well, they got to figure it out, but certainly it's a software world. And one of the things that's interesting we were talking before we started is, you know, they are stuck in that op operator world, but it's part of DevOps, dev and ops. This is the world that it operates. Google's cloud shows how to do it. You got SREs run, run things and the developers just program infrastructure as code. This is the promise of, of this new generation. Sorry, we talk about it all the time on Twitter. Yeah. Developers coding away, not dealing with the infrastructure. That's the yeah. goal. Traditionally, developers never sort of mucked around with infrastructure, and gradually we are moving into like where developers have to take care of the infrastructure themselves. The teams are like two pizza teams, we hear that all the time, that they are responsible for running the show from beginning to the end. Operations are under them, like it's dev and ops are put together, right? But uh, I'll speak from my own personal experience working at VMware in the past, that from all the companies which are operations focused, that's HP, IBM, and Oracle to certain extent with Sun sort of portfolio and all that, it, it, in, in BMC and CA, those are pure companies in the operations space, right? Uh, I think VMware is one of those which values software uh, a lot. So it's a purely inside the VMware is purely software driven, but to the outside of what they produce, what they have produced in the past, that's for operations, right? So, but that, I think they can move that switch because of the culture, and then with Pivotal acquisition, I think it will make it much easier because there's some following uh, of the Pivotal uh, stack, if you will. The only caveat I think on that side is like it, it is kind of a little bit vendor lock in ish, right? Um, that is well, one of the fears I have. Yeah. Who's not? Even Red Hat these days is, you know, yeah. Yeah, locking it, you in. It, yes. You know, I posted an interesting stat, metadata from a blog post from Paul Fazone announcing the pivotal acquisition. Mm -hmm. He mentioned Kubernetes 22 times, he mentioned Pivotal Kyle Foundry once. Yeah. So VMware is all in on this open shift type movement. I think, they're, they're, I think VMware is looking at the 
Redshift, I mean, oh, Red OpenShift acquisition by IBM and thinking, man, I wish we didn't have this sister relationship with Pivotal so we could have went out and bought well, Red Well, that's a good point about um, Kubernetes, I think you're right on that. And remember, we've been covering OpenStack up until about a year ago and they changed the name, it's now something else, but I remember when OpenShift wasn't doing well. I mean, I do too. And what really was a tipping point for them was, they had all the elements, but it was Kubernetes that really put them in a position to take advantage of what they were trying to do, and I think, you're right, I think VMware sees that, now that IBM owns Red Hat and OpenShift, well, you know, that's clear. But and I think the vSphere de deal with Project Pacific points out that they want to use Kubernetes as an abstraction layer for developers and have a developer interface to vSphere. So they get the operators with vSphere, they put Kubernetes in there, and they say, hey developers, use us. Now I think that's a hedge also against Pivotal. Because well, if that horse doesn't come across the track at the finish line, it, it, it's, know, it's definitely a hedge on containers. Just a finer, finer point of what you were saying, there was a slight difference in the cash outlay for Red Hat, 34 billion, <laughs> versus the cash outlay for Pivotal was 800 million. <laughs> so they picked up an 800 million dollar asset, uh, or, a, or a two point, or a four billion well, dollar asset. Explain for that because it was 2.7 billion was the number reported. We reported. So you're saying that VMware put out only 800 million in correct. cash. It's a, which it, was that mean? Correct. So they, they put out 800 million in cash uh, to the existing shareholders of Pivotal, which is a minority of the shareholders. Michael Dell owns 70% of it. VMware owns 15% of it. So they take the public shareholders, you know, get, get the 800 million. They get taken out. Yep. Michael Dell gets more VMware stocks, so now he owns more of VMware. VMware already owns 15% of Pivotal, so for 800 million, they get Pivotal. So did the, the, the VMware uh, independent shareholders get they got diluted. Did, did right. they lose out in the deal is the question. And, and, the que and I think the thing that most people are missing in this conversation is that Pivotal has a army of developers. W regardless of whether their developers focus on PCF or, or Kubernetes is irrelevant. VMware has an army of, a services army now that they can point towards the industry and say we have the chops to have the conversation around why you should come to us for So I want to come back to that, but just a really good question is do, do the, do the VMware shareholders get screwed. Near term, the stock drops, right? Which is what happens, right? P Pivotal was up 77% on the day the Dow dropped 800 points. Here's where I think it makes sense, and there are some external risks. Pivotal plus Carbon Black, the, the combination, they shelled out 2.7 billion in cash. They're going to add a billion dollars to VMware's subscription business next year. VMware trades at 5X revenue multiple. So, the shareholders will, in, in, in theory, get back five billion. In year two, it's going to be three billion that they're going to add to the subscription revenue. So in theory, that's 15 billion of value add. I think that's, that goes into the, to the thinking. So now, are people going to flock to VMware? You know, are Kubernetes developers going to flock to VMware? I mean, to your point, that, to me, that's, that's the value of Pivotal is they can get VMware into the developer community, because where, where is VMware with developers? Nobody, no developers in this audience. That's true. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I, th I think the, we have to dissect the, the workloads of applications at the enterprise level, right? There are vendor provided applications, right, from SAP Oracles of the world, right? Those are two heavyweights, right, in the ap application space. And then there are these long tail of ISVs, right? And then there's homegrown applications. I think. Uh, where uh, Pivotal plays a big role is the homegrown applications. When you're shipping a lot as, as, as an ISV, or within your enterprise, you are, you're writing software, but you're shipping applications to the user base. It can be internal for partners, for customers, right? Uh, I think that, that's where Pivotal plays, um, Pivotal is Pivotal, if you will. That's a good bet, too. One of the yeah. things we've been polling the CISOs, Dave, for when we were at Reinforce, we started polling um, CISOs in our network, and it's interesting. The, they're under the gun to produce, produce security solutions and manage the vendors, do all that stuff. They are all telling us, majority of them are telling us that they're building their own stacks internally to handle the crisis and the, uh, and the challenge of security, which I think is a leading indicator versus the kind of slow, slower CIO, which loves multi-anything, multi-vendor, control, like I deal with contracts. CISOs, they don't have the dogma because they can't have the dogma. They got to deliver, and they're saying, we're going to build a stack on one cloud 
I have a backup cloud, I want all my developer resources on this cloud, not fork my team, and I'm going to build a stack, and I'm then I'm going to ship APIs to say to my suppliers in the RFP process, say, if you support these APIs, you can do business with us. So That's kind of a cutting edge. If you don't, edge. you can't. If you don't, you can't, yeah. you can't. And that's the new normal, we're seeing it with the Jet idea, with Oracle not getting, playing, because they're not certified at the level of, that Amazon is, and you're going to start to see these new requirements emerging. This is a huge point. I think that is where Pivotal could really shine, not being the, quote, developer channel for VMware. I think it's more of really writing apps. And John, I think people are even going to question that model. Capital One is probably the poster child for that model. They actually went out even and, and acquired a startup, a security, uh, a container security startup, integrated them in to their operations, and they still failed. Security in the cloud is hard. I think we'll get into a multi-cloud discussion. This is one of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of multi-cloud from an architecture perspective, but from a practical challenge, security is one of the number one challenges. Yeah, that's a great point on Capital One. In fact, that's a great example. In fact, I love to argue this point. I was on Twitter, I was heavily arguing this point, which is, yeah, they had a breach. But that was a very low level, it's like the equivalent of an S3 bucket not being configured, right? I mean, it was so trivial of a problem, but still, it takes one whole, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> one, one entry point for malware to get in, one entry point to get into any network, whereas IoT, this is the huge challenge. So the question there is automation. Do you do the, so again, these are, that's a solvable problem with Capital One. The, what we don't know is, what has Capital One done that we don't know that they've solved? So again, I look at that breach as pretty, major, obviously major, but it was a freaking misconfigured firewall. So, so come back to your comments on multi-cloud. I'm inferring from what you said, and I'd love to get your opinion, Sarbjeet that multi-cloud is not an architectural strategy. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I've said this, it's kind of a symptom of you got multiple vendors playing, but so can multi-cloud become, because certainly VMware, uh, IBM Red Hat, Google with Anthos, maybe a little bit less Microsoft, but those three, Delta Cisco, Cisco and certainly Dell, all talking about multi-cloud is, is, is the clear strategy, that's where CIOs are going. You're not buying it. Um, will it ever become a, 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 a clear strategy from an architectural standpoint? Multi-cloud is the NSX, and I don't mean NSX and VMware NSX, it's the accurate NSX of enterprise IT. The idea of owning the NSX is great, it brings me into the showroom, but I am going to buy, I'm going to go over to the Honda uh, side or I'm going to go buy the MDX or something more reasonable. Multi-cloud, the idea, sure it's possible. It's possible for me to own a NSX sports car, but it's more practical for me to be able to shop around. I can go to Google via Cloud Simple. I mean, I can go to uh, Cloud via Sound, Cloud Simple to Azure, uh, GCP, or I can go uh, BMC. I have options to where I land, but to say that I'm going to operate across all three, that's the NSX. Yeah, so if you have an NSX sports car, by the way, the, the, using the analogy in my mind is a great one. The roads aren't open yet. Yeah, so yeah. like, yeah, so okay, great. Well, or you go to Germany and you're in California. So you know, the, the transport again, the applications you could build tech for good applications all you want, and they're talking about tech for good here. But if the if it's unsecure, those apps are going to create more entry points again for for cyber threats, for malware. So again, the security equation, you're right, is super important, and they don't have it. What are your, I, what's your thought on that? I think on multi-cloud, you, you, when you are going to use multi-cloud, you're going to expand the the threat surface, if you will, right? Like because you're putting stuff at different places. But I don't think, as you said, uh, Dave, like the, the multi-cloud is not more architectural choice, it's more like a, a risk uh, mitigation strategy from the vendor point of view. Like Amazon, does, who they don't compete with, or who, who will they won't compete with in the future, we don't know, right? You mean so, within an industry? Yeah, within an Autos industry, right? Autos or healthcare. So, yeah, yeah or they or will, or they, they are yeah. talking about that, right? So if you put all, all so all your bets on that, or Azure, let's say even Azure, right? They are not in that kind of category, but still, if you go with one vendor, and that's mission critical, and something happens, like government breaks them up, or they go under, sideways, whatever, right? And then your business is stuck with them. And another thing is that the whole US business, if you think about it at a global scale, like what where US stands and all that stuff, and even global companies are using these, our cloud providers based in the US, um, these, these companies are becoming, like they're becoming too big to fail. 
right? If you put everything on one company, right? And, and then something happens, like, will we bail them out? Right? Will the government bail them out? Like stuff like that. The like banks became too big to fail. I think, I think for from that point of view, bigger companies will shift to multi multi cloud for to hedge right risk mitigation. Risk mitigation. Yeah, that's okay. Right? That's yeah. fair. I, I mean, I believe, I believe in multi cloud in one definition only. I think for now. The nirvana of having dynamic workload management across utility bases, that's fantasy. I think it's you could fantasy. probably engineer it, but there might not be a, a workload for that. Or dream. maybe data analytics I can see moving around as a use case, um, certainly. But I think um, DR. the reality DR. is, is that mul all companies will probably have multiple clouds, clearly. Like, if you're going to run Office 365 and that's going to be on Azure, you're an Azure customer, okay? You have Azure Cloud. If you're building your security stack on Amazon and got a development team, you're on Amazon. You got two clouds. They had Google in there. Big tables, great for certain things. You know, big query. You got Google. Yeah. You might even have Alibaba if you're operating in China. So again, you can have multiple clouds. The question is, the workloads define the cloud selection. So I've been on this thing. Like, if you got a workload, an app, that app should choose its best infrastructure possible yeah. that maximizes what the outcome is. And John, I think what people fail to realize that users, when you give them a set of tools, they're going to do what users do, which is be productive. Just like users went out and took credit cards, swiped it, and got Amazon. If, you, if in your environment you have Amazon, you have GCP, you have Azure, you have Salesforce, O365, and a user has access to all five platforms, whether or not you built a multi-cloud application, a user is going to find a way to get their work done with all five, and you're going to have multi-cloud um, fallout because users will build data sets and workloads across that, even if IT is the one isn't the one that designed it. All right, guys. Final question on the power panel, Dave. I'm going to include this for you too, and I'll weigh in as well. Um, take a, uh, a minute to share what your thinking right now is on the industry. What's taking up your attention? What's dominating your Twitter sphere right now? What's What's the bee in your bonnet? What's a hot button issue that you're kicking the tires on learning about or promoting? Um, so we we'll start with you. What's, what's, on, what's on top of mind for you these days? I think we, we talk about multi-cloud all the time. That's, that's in discussions all the time. And then, then blockchain is another like slow moving train, if you will. I think it's, it's arriving, arriving now. And uh, we will see some solutions coming down the pike and, uh, from different uh, like a platformization of the blockchain, if you will, that's happening. I think those are the two uh, actually things I um, keep my eyes on, and and how developers kind of move, which side they take, and then how how the AWS dominance uh, is challenged by Microsoft and Google. Um, there's one thing I usually talk about I want Twitter and Twitter sphere is that there's a there's a data uh, gravity and there's a skills gravity right so people who are getting trained on Amazon they will tend to stay with that because that's at the end of the day it's people using technology right so moving from one to another is a challenge whoever throws in a lot of education at the developers and operators they will win Keith, what do you what do you what do you get inside about? So CTO advisor has this theory about the data framework or data infrastructure. Multi-cloud is the conversation about workloads going here, there, irrelevant. It's all about the data. How do I have a consistent data policy, data protection policy, data management policy across SaaS, mm -hmm. O365, Salesforce Workday? my IaaS providers, my PaaS providers, and on-prem, how do I move that data and uh, make sure uh, uh, another data management backup company won best of VMworld this year. This is like the third or fourth year in the reason. It's not because of backup, it's because CIOs, CDOs are concerned about this data challenge and as much as we want to talk about multi-cloud, I think we'll, the industry will discover the, the problem isn't in Kubernetes or solution isn't in Kubernetes. It's going to be one of these cool startups or one of these legacy vendors such as NetApp, Dell EMC that solves that data management layer. All right, great stuff. My hot button's cloud 2.0, as everyone knows. I think there's new requirements that are coming out, and what got my attention is this enterprise action of VMware, the CIA deal on Amazon, the JEDI deal, show that there are new requirements that our customers are driving that the vendors don't have, and that's a function that cloud providers are going to provide, and I think that's the canary in the coal I mine. I got to chime in, I got to chime in. I, 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 sorry, Leonard, but 
it's the combination, what excites me is the combination of data plus machine intelligence and cloud scale. A new scenario of disruption, moving beyond a remote set of cloud services to a ubiquitous set of digital services powered by data that are going to disrupt every industry. That's what I get excited Guys, about. Guys, great power panel. We'll pick this up online. We'll actually get the power panels yeah. working out of our Palo Alto studio. If you haven't seen the power panels, check them out. Search Power Panel The Cube on on Google, you'll see the videos. We talk about an issue, we get experts. It's an editorial product. We'll see more of that online. More coverage here at VMworld 2019 after this short break. <laughs>